Good afternoon, colleagues. My name is Matthew Child. I work at the South African National Biodiversity Institute, where I'm the project coordinator for biodiversity informatics. And today, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our work on mainstreaming data into wildlife economy policies. Um, this work draws on numerous ideas and interactions with a whole range of people, in particular my two academic confidants, Haley Clements from Stellenbosch University and Alta de Foss from Rhodes University, my two agroecological systems pros, Kara Linderstedt from, and Lehman Lindeke from the United Nations Development Program, my two wildlife um, ranching pros, um, John Herter from Wildlife Ranching South Africa and Leanne Kant from Nelson Mandela University, and Roland Favac from the Department of Environment, who um, is championing these ideas. An alternative name for this talk is the Sustainable Wildlife Economies Project, because that's the project that all of us have developed um, over this past year. And you can find more details on it at www.wildlifeeconomy or wildeconomy.org. Sorry. I'm sure you're all familiar with what wildlife ranches are. But the key point is they exist on a spectrum between pure livestock and arable agriculture and pure statutory protected areas, where consumptive utilization of wildlife normally forms a core part of the business model, and multiple land uses and economic activities are usually combined. These include activities such as game meat production, trophy hunting, live animal sales, ecotourism, um, and other, other activities like that. And importantly, approximately half of these wildlife ranches um, are mixed wildlife and livestock farms. And these diverse um, production systems are in many ways then more akin to agriculture with conservation benefits rather than protected areas with consumptive activities. But agroecological thinking is not necessarily currently reflected in the policies promoting the wildlife economy development or even of conservation estates um, expansion. And these um, rewilded agroecological units may be particularly effective um, at restoring grass productivity um, and, and probably more generally ecosystem functioning. Um, some preliminary work that we have been doing with, with, with some colleagues shows that when you look at EBI trends over time, um, residual EBI trends, i.e. rainfall corrected, the Wildlife ranches, since converting from livestock ranches, have shown the greatest um, increases in grass biomass relative to um, rotationally managed livestock farms, which is the green line, protected areas, um, formal protected areas, that is, which is the blue line, and communal rangelands, which is the red line. Um, so this is good in terms of increasing forage production and potential soil carbon sequestration. And um, in terms of woody, plant biomass increase, a lot of which would be considered bush encroachment. Um, over time, it is the rotationally managed livestock ranches that have shown the greatest residual increases, most probably due to a lack of browsers, but that remains to be investigated. But this um, is evidence that, that um, wildlife ranches do increase restoration potential. And we know that wildlife ranching can also be more profitable than comparative livestock ranching. Um, both through gross revenues, but also ultimate um, return on investment. Um, and it can also provide more employment opportunities and higher monthly salaries because of the more skilled labor that it requires. And this is all down to the diverse economic portfolio that um, wildlife-based enterprises offer. There are several policies um, under development at the moment to do with the wildlife economy. Um, in South Africa, we've got the National Biodiversity Economy Strategy, um, which amongst other things aims to add about 2 million hectares to the wildlife estates um, to benefit communities, as well as creating about 100,000 jobs in the process. The High Level Panel Recommendations um, promulgates a new policy on biodiversity and sustainable use, and that entails a lot of different components, which um, Sambi will have to advise on and interlink with, with other policies and, and regulatory frameworks. More regionally, the department is, is spearheading an initiative um, to develop a strategic framework on the SADC based wildlife economy, where the lessons from our own wildlife economy is obviously going to play an important part. And there are various other countries that are developing similar sorts of policies. So all of these kind of center around this idea of creating um, thriving, resilient um, socioeconomic systems that sustainably utilize wildlife and that are, of course, inclusive. 
but how is the question um, considering we we have almost no data on how the industry actually works or um, what the biodiversity contributions of the sector actually are so lack of data isn't the only problem that's been identified to developing wildlife economies these are the barriers identified from the wildlife economy lab from 2016 um, and they range from things such as inefficient utilization of land to insufficient interdepartmental coordination to insufficient awareness and capitalization of mixed wildlife and livestock farms um, and grouped into kind of three broad areas one being barriers to transformation or inclusivity risks of uh, future growth stagnation and then unsupportive enabling environments but the key thing is that this um, is, is a kind of reactive um, analysis of the problem um, and reflects the underlying symptoms rather than the drivers so we need to understand the drivers to these to these barriers first before we can identify the appropriate solutions so if we reorganize these barriers into a situational or a problem analysis um, this will help us to identify the kind of critical pathways or the drivers so the way we perceive it um, the primary barrier is a lack of evidence and information delivery a lack of um, evidence-based decision making which leads to a lack of agroecological systems thinking or integration and collectively those two themes can be thought of as um, poor policy design which leads to ineffective or insufficient policy implementation and this can be thought of as a general lack of decision support tools so that's from uh, the bottom up um, and then from sort of the top down is this issue of um, global more policy bias and i'll think uh, i'll talk a little bit more about that later and uh, more general a, a misinformed public where yeah there's not a lot of um, awareness of the of the benefits of sustainable use of wildlife and this can be thought of as policy perception, which um, of course reinforces or re-entrenches um, uh, often poor policy design in this kind of maladaptive um, circle. So I'm not going to go through through all of this, um, but just to say that this this helps us to then identify kind of critical pathways where really the fundamental issue, um, as we see it, is this lack of um, insufficient holistic information on how wildlife ranches work, their biodiversity contributions, their socioeconomic contributions, sustainable land management contributions, etc., which leads to um, this lack of awareness of, of these um, production landscapes as agroecological systems, which then causes, um, oh, sorry, and then on the other hand, of course, this is entrenched by this um, uh, lack of understanding of the benefits of sustainable use in this um, uh, biased public perception which then um, creates these, these um, inappropriate or, or insufficient decision support tools, such as the incorrect technical skills and business support, because policies are being pushed for these areas to become protected areas, um, rather than yeah, um, making use of programs like the Recapitalization Fund to actually um, set up viable wildlife economies for, for communities and new market entrants. So understanding these problems systematically, um, we can then start to develop a high level theory of change for how to unlock wildlife economies. Um, I'm not going to go through the problems, um, but there are a few steps in between. And then we can also re-articulate the vision um, that most of these high level policies boil down to. And really you can view them as sort of three component parts, which you can then set performance indicators to or smart indicators. The one being wilder working landscapes, so how do we use wildlife as assets to unlock working landscapes, um, which feeds into the restoration of degraded land, so how do we meet land degradation neutrality goals, and then of course how does this benefit um, the well-being and socioeconomic opportunities of communities. So we developed a theory of change to help achieve this vision and unlock wildlife economies both nationally and across the continent. I'm not going to go through the entire diagram so it would take too long but essentially it boils down to three different pathways that are also interlinked the first is to break down the silos between agriculture and conservation departments and to co-design policy and implementation in these agroecological systems the second would be to use extension support or at least um, collect information and co-design the knowledge products and the decision support tools that would help both um, implementing offices 
from the governments, but also um, the stakeholders themselves understand what the wildlife economy is, and to use those knowledge products to invest more effectively and efficiently to enhance the enterprise viability. And then finally, to, to win back the hearts and minds of the public by um, using science to come up um, with standards that show that the sustainable use of wildlife contributes massively to the conservation of states and, of course, to socio-economic and to socio-economic developments. So, if we look at Part A One, this agroecological policy design, in more detail, we see that there's numerous legislative tools available in the Department of Agriculture, Land Reform, and Rural Development, in particular the Conservation of Agricultural Resources Act which is relevant to this broader idea of restoration on, on rangelands, obviously. Um, and on the Department of Environment, Forestry and Fisheries side, there's really only two um, pieces of legislation that are relevant to, to wildlife ranching, the one being NEMBA that we're all familiar with, and of course the Game Theft Act. So it's really only fair that we um, integrate and streamline the regulatory frameworks between these, between these two departments. Um, and of course, to do this, we need the currency of information. So to start generating this, this information that's necessary to inform policy design, we took advantage of the Presidential Employment Stimulus Program that ran earlier this year to employ 37 youth to conduct semi-structured surveys with wildlife ranchers in the Eastern Cape. And here, um, the project team, who I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, designed a holistic survey that integrated aspects of wildlife management and biodiversity conservation with sustainable land management and, and restoration, along with the socioeconomic profiles of wildlife ranches to really get a foundational understanding of the drivers of these agroecological systems. And we developed um, a, a workflow to, to have a look at this, um, which I, we can send to you if you want. I'm not going to go through it in, in detail. And it also included a, fault, a rapid fault condition assessment. So we feel that this is quite an integrated and um, novel way to understand wildlife ranching in, in the country. So this beautiful map that Kara made shows the distribution of our survey sites across the Eastern Cape, and you can see it's got a fairly good spread across the different biomes. Overall, we conducted 128 surveys, and these included, the majority of them were the established wildlife ranches, but we also included several um, reference state systems, such as protected areas, straight cattle farms, and we also focused on land reform sites. And I will discuss that in more detail a little bit later. Um, and we've also recently completed a pilot in Limpopo where we did 33 ranches. So on a broad level, we found that transitioning to wildlife ranching has enabled a broad scale restoration from formerly cultivated land to what could now be considered old fields or, or near natural. Um, and in some cases, it's also increased the amount of natural habitat, what we're calling rangelands, um, through property expansion, etc. And there's also been relatively little um, impact of clearing land for planted pastures um, to grow fodder crops, like Lucerne. But of course, there's wide variation in that. So really, overall, we can see that there is a net um, restorative effect of wildlife ranching, um, and that this is a huge, this is a big implication for policy integration, or at least regulatory integration between um, regulations under CARA and regulations under NEMBA. Um, and it shows that if you shift the focus to landscape scale, you might be able to get a better perspective on how these areas are contributing to, to multiple policy targets. Of course, we still need to verify this information um, in more detail with remote sensing products, but this is an exciting finding. I'd like to just give you an example of how these data might inform specific decision data pathways. In this case, this is a graph, um, thanks to Alta, showing that when ranches converted from livestock to wildlife, the majority of these wildlife ranches have converted from livestock or mixed farms, mixed crop and livestock farms, to mixed wildlife farms, i.e. they have cattle and all crops and all wildlife. 
um, and this is 55% of the survey ranches. Now this stands in, in, in pretty stark contrast to the way that we normally think of, of wildlife care systems as um, heading towards uh, inexorably the ecotourism and private protected area status. Um, and this really should give us pause to say maybe we need to stop seeing mixed farms as a transitional land use and actually see them as a viable and resilient land use because clearly they are they are a successful strategy in the space. And so we need to um, invest in the kind of infrastructure and skill development that would enable this to be um, a key land use in this in this sector. And can we go one step further and see livestock as a land management tool to mitigate the potential negative effects of fenced wildlife ranches? So for example, could we use a combination of relatively low wildlife stocking densities combined with some form of high intensity rotational grazing of sheep or cattle to ensure grass productivity is maintained while also providing access to wildlife product markets? And if so, how could we go about designing these systems? And so with our colleagues from the Department of Environment and Department of Land Reform, we are starting to develop workflows that would enable us to identify the knowledge products needed to inform these decision-making processes. So for example, in the case of biodiversity economy node deployment or development and the land reform process, um, some of the key decision-making processes are to prioritize or identify suitable land parcels for, for the development of the wildlife economy, and then to prioritize investment, both public and private, into wildlife assets, infrastructure, skills development programs, etc. Um, and just focusing, I'm not going to go through the entire graph, um, I can send it to you if you'd like, but just focusing on the yellow pathway in terms of business case and business model development, we would need some kind of toolkits to help land reform beneficiaries and, and communities understand from um, lessons learned essentially from the established sector, what are the viable business models? As noted in the previous slide, mixed livestock and, and wildlife farms are certainly one. Um, and to do that, we would need to um, develop business model typologies, um, with asset lists, uh, yeah, expected returns on investments, all those kind of things. Um, and of course, to do that, we need the appropriate um, survey data, um, which can or cannot be constructed into the EVV and um, essential ecosystem service variable concepts. Um, and that is exactly what we've done with the SWEP project, is to collect that uh, correct information that will be able to inform these kind of information products. So what might a decision support tool for wildlife economy businesses look like? Well, um, on the left there, if we are able to analyze um, what viable businesses are. So for example, um, Clements et al. 2016 identified four distinct business models um, from her private protected area data set and of course from the SWEP project. We've already um, understood it from other sources that mixed farms are, are a big um, um, business model. So if, you, if we are able to cluster those um, and then understand the attributes of each of those business models, so things like what are the asset requirements, what are the infrastructure requirements, what kind of skills do you need, what kind of um, yeah, mentorship programs might be useful, etc then you can channel that into the RAND value of that. So what are the investment requirements? Uh, and that can be fed onto profiling certain projects on investment platforms like the Department of Environment is currently trying to do with the Game Changer platform. Um, and then that can be also distilled into the financial profile of, of the ranch. So um, what is the capital costs of establishing a certain business model from scratch and therefore what are the expected returns over how long, etc. And that can be fed into investor confidence, but also um, inputs it into some kind of screening tool. So for example, um, we might want to know um, whether some business models are very prone to um, certain types of landscapes or need um, proximity to certain types of um, other businesses such as airports or, or tanneries, etc. Um, and what are the distances that those need to be? And what is the minimum area of particular um, land parcel that, that, a, that a certain type of business model can support? All of that can be um, developed at 
to, to a screening tool um, that can then help to inform your market entrance on what is the sort of most bang for their buck um, when developing their enterprise. And finally, can we use these foundational data sets to try and win back the hearts and minds of the public um, who have had their understanding of the uh, benefits of sustainable use systematically eroded over time through certain interest groups. Um, and to do that, the Department of Environment, together with um, a number of different stakeholders, are attempting to develop a wildlife economy certification scheme, which would be a market-based incentive for um, participating ranches and will provide a market signal um, for the broader benefits of the sustainable use of wildlife. And this is um, explicitly designed along the agroecological thinking um, to do with pathway one. So it includes um, or will include three components. One being population management, wildlife management, um, this is kind of traditional um, regula regu regulations that we that we have come to know. Then the next one is to do with rangeland management, fall condition, um, etc. And this links to the coral regulations and the Department of Agriculture and Land Reform. Um, and of course, now has an emerging link with uh, natural capital accounting. And then last but not least, this issue of um, socioeconomic upliftment, beneficiation, sustainable development goals around um, equal employment of women, etc. All of which we know that the wildlife economy can achieve. And the way in which um, we could use this is to provide a diagnostic for participating ranches to see where they could improve to qualify or to continue to qualify um, to be certified and gain that market premium. This is um, the wildlife economy work is critically important as we enter the decade of restoration, um, which until now has kind of been dominated by a global north perception of restoration around planting trees, which is great if you're in the tropics, um, which are, can lead to perverse incentives when countries start including pine plantations as part of their biodiversity targets, or indeed planting trees in um, savanna or grass and rangelands, uh, and thereby undermining their productivity and biodiversity value. And really, um, this is uh, one opportunity for, for South Africa and Africa to to present a global south perspective on what restoration can and should be um, towards a working lands concept of being able to simultaneously sequester carbon um, and mitigate climate change, uh, create wildlife habitats and create sustainable economies. And really that is um, pr presented as a key ecosystem-based adaptation um, around the sustainable use concept. Because we need big ideas to get out of this quagmire that we're in and uh, wildlife economies might just be one of those ideas. So thanks for listening um, and I look forward to yeah, um, working with you in, in some way. Thank you.